Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, Slack makes its public debut, joining other high-profile tech names, but not by the usual IPO path. Plus, Facebook reveals plans for its own cryptocurrency with much fanfare, but lawmakers in Washington are pushing back. And we have an exclusive sit-down with COO Sheryl Sandberg, who responds to the controversy in Facebook's two years of bad news. First, to our top story, Slack makes its public debut via a direct listing on the New York Stock Exchange. Shares opening 48% above its reference price at $38.50 a share, valuing the software Messenger at more than $20 billion. That's a big increase from Slack's last private valuation. The company raised money at a $7.1 billion valuation back in August. I caught up with Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield and Alan Shim, Slack's CFO, right before shares began trading. I think for, <laughs> at this point it has been uh, working exactly the way it was supposed to work. Um, and ultimately we'll open, we'll have a high and a low today, we'll close, and then the same thing's going to happen tomorrow and the next day and the next day, and uh, we are very much focused on the long term. Now, you're still paying large fees to bankers. You still raised a lot of money on the private market. So what problem are you really solving, Stuart, by doing a direct listing versus the traditional IPO? Well, uh, the, the first one is that no need to raise primary capital. We came into this process with over $800 million on the balance sheet, so the dilution to existing shareholders would have been tough. I think we did get a little bit more freedom in how we tell the story, so it, in addition to a roadshow, but instead of only having a roadshow in private rooms with the investors, we were able to do an investor day, uh, live stream it, and make the video available to everyone, um, and that, I think, is uh, put us in a better position. Now, Alan, Slack is still on profit profitable and the markets have rewarded profits even if they're slim profits how far out is profitability well our primary focus right now is to invest in growth and as we continue to build on what we think is a new category that's going to be our focus for a long time but we've also said to investors that our near term pro uh, priority is to drive towards cash flow break even we have high confidence in the strong unit economics of our business that we can still invest very aggressively while driving towards that near term uh, profitability uh, mark so then, Stuart, how much of a priority would you say that profitability actually is? I think, uh, I don't want to get too technical about it. In SaaS, there's a lot of deferred revenue, so accounting profitability isn't that much of a priority. As Alan was saying, bringing in more cash than we put out on an ongoing basis is a priority because it allows us to control our own destiny. The ideal for us, though, is that we continually find new ways and new opportunities to invest to further grow the business. So we don't need a lot of free cash flow, but um, just a little bit. Now, Alan, revenue growth is slowing. What are some new sources of revenue you're expecting to tap? Well, we're very pleased with the revenue growth. I think what you're seeing is also we're making great traction with customers, and we've got over 95,000 paid customers today. Our enterprise customers are also growing even faster. So we have 645 customers, over 100K in revenue. And I think what you're seeing is we're scaling. So at the base of revenue that we're at now, some of the revenue growth just mathematically will come down. But we're very uh, optimistic about the opportunity. We believe there's a huge new category to be built and invested behind. So we're focused on that. Now, Stuart, we've charted your progress from the very beginning. I went back into our archives. The first interview I did with you was in 2011 when you were CEO of TinySpec wow. and you were making a game called Glitch, yeah. which sort of became Slack. In 2015, Jared Leto crashed our interview. I will never forget that. Um, your employees, your users really love the sort of quirkiness of Slack, which is an ethos very much inspired by you. That said, you are becoming a public company. You are going to be doing earnings calls every quarter. How do you manage that transition with public investors holding your feet to the fire? I think uh, both Alan and I have been committed, and this is not a recent thing, but over the course of many years on building the kind of internal controls and systems that would allow us to operate as a public company. Um, so it, um, you know, the financial business operation side, that began uh, a long time ago, and we've been working with the whole company to kind of transition in the limited number of ways that we do. I mean, the, we believe we can keep the same culture, we can believe we can uh, keep the same approach to serving customers. If you think about our mission to make people's working lives simpler,
simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. There's uh, a nice humility to it because we do want to be of service, but there's also a huge ambition. And uh, I think the, the challenge for us, or you know, like a kind of a, what we're going to have to pull off, is bringing investors along on that ride and, and help them understand what the long-term vision is and what we can truly do uh, to support companies all over the world. Now, you're entering a volatile market. We're in the midst of a trade war with China. You could imagine in an economic downturn that businesses are going to cut budgets. They might not cut email. They might not cut Microsoft Office. They might cut the nice-to-haves, and they might think that Slack falls into that category. Stuart, how big a risk is that? I don't see any real risk in that. We have exceptional retention, so industry leading on both the enterprise side and the SMB side. Um, our customers tell us Slack is the kind of thing that they didn't know they needed, but once they have it, they can't live without it. And if you can't live without something, it's not going to be one of the, the items that are cut on a discretionary basis. So, Alan, would you say, you know, how much do these market fluctuations, how much are you following what's happening in the global economy? <laughs> well, we, we watch it like anybody already. else, but it doesn't necessarily affect the way we run our business. We're building a new category. We have so many things to focus on in supporting our customers and building this ambition of a new way of working. So we control what we can control, and the markets do what they need to do. Uh, Stuart, analysts say that chat apps are a dime a dozen. You've got huge competitors like Microsoft, like Facebook, with deep pockets and billions of users. Over the longer term, how do you differentiate yourself? How do you compete when even you say in your own risk factors you haven't figured out the optimal price because it depends often on what your competitors are doing? Uh, at Slack, we say we are competitor aware but customer obsessed. And I know it's hard for me to imagine anything that any competitor would do that would uh, cause us to change our plans um, when those plans are all oriented around creating value for our customers. So uh, one of the things we want to do is put ourselves in a position such that Slack, the company, becomes more valuable as the world uses more software because Slack, the product, becomes more valuable for each of our customers as they use more software because of the platform, because of the integrations. Uh, you know, there's a whole world out there uh, of other software. The number of categories continues to proliferate. The number of dollars that companies invest in software every year continues to go up. So in that kind of market and in a, in a world where we have 10 million daily active users out of the 200 million plus that we believe would benefit from Slack, it's just wide open. That was Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield and CFO Alan Shim. For more on Slack, we spoke with Steven Sanofsky, board partner at Andreessen Horowitz, an investor in Slack, and Bloomberg's Alan Hewitt. Well, this one might be more of a question of can Microsoft fend off Slack? Uh, you know, right now in the, the way that industry leaders have talked about, Slack is generally viewed as the leader, certainly by, by a bunch of the measures and, you know, 10 million daily active users, monthly active users, and, and so on. So I think they're in a really great position. The industry is undergoing a phenomenal amount of change in terms of the way people work. Um, people are looking for alternatives to email, things that work faster, smoother, things that integrate more software, and I, I think Slack does a fantastic job of doing that. Now, Ellen, in terms of the mechanics today, we had a lot of questions about why they chose a direct listing. You talked to Stuart, I talked to Stuart, the CEO, Stuart Butterfield. Do you think we got an answer? I think so. <laughs> he was finally, now that the quiet period's over, able to explain that the main reason Slack was looking to do a direct listing was because they just didn't want to dilute their shares any further. They have a lot of cash. They feel confident that they don't need to raise any more money in the length of their, um, their lifetime as a company. And doing a direct listing allows you to do that. It just allows you to go public, put your shares on the market, and not dilute by issuing new shares to sell. So then why did they raise so much money up to this point? I mean, he has said it's things in the past. Uh, we have more money than we'll ever need. We've got money for a rainy day in whatever, 50 years. Um, so why? It must have felt worth it to him at the time. He said to me earlier this morning, you know, we were always getting a really fair valuation. We found that capital was really available. And it's true. Slack has always been sort of a darling of the venture capital world. And I can imagine they were really able to probably negotiate the deals that they they felt were really good for them in the private market and just don't feel a need to raise more. Um, I have a chart here in the Bloomberg which just shows how U.S. IPOs and U.S. Uh, tech IPOs have been performing uh, so far this year. So, uh, uh, you know, Stephen, you ran Office, you ran Windows, and one of the big questions about Slack is, is it just a nice to have? You know, if companies are going to cut budgets, if there's an economic downturn, and there is a lot of macroeconomic uncertainty, 
why would they pay for Slack and not cut office? Or why would they pay for Slack and cut office? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I think you know, the thing about uh, the workplace, and even during bad times, it turns out that the, the, the companies think about information technology as a way to, to invest in order to make it through the bad times. Your company becomes more efficient, you communicate better, you get more done, you serve your customers better, and that actually re reduces the impact of economic cycles. And we've seen that for decades in terms of the way that technology investing looks. And I think in this case, Slack isn't really a, a, a nice to have. It, it's, it's fundamentally rethinking the, the way that, that companies really approach the sharing of information and collaboration and work, and making it much more modern, moving from silos of email to a an open communication platform. Steven Sanofsky there with Andreessen Horowitz and Bloomberg's Ellen Hewitt. We should note that Bloomberg Beta, the venture capital arm of Bloomberg LP, is an investor in Slack. Coming up, our conversation with Sheryl Sandberg, including what she has to say about Facebook's new crypto play, Libra, with it already facing major blowback on Capitol Hill. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Facebook unveiled plans for a new cryptocurrency called Libra that will soon launch as early as next year. David Marcus, the former PayPal CEO who led development of Libra, spoke to Bloomberg about the goals of the new project. He'll now lead Calibra, a new organization that will help oversee Libra. We went the blockchain route because we will have, by the time we launch, a hundred different global organizations that will participate in the governance of this new network uh, uh, and currency. Twenty-seven uh, organizations right now, uh, and so we needed we needed a way to decentralize governance because no one company should control a network uh, that basically is a protocol for value on the internet. Still, lawmakers are already calling for the social network to stop developing Libra immediately until regulators weigh in. COO Sheryl Sandberg says lots of details still need to be worked out, and she also talked about Facebook's broader M&A strategy in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde at the Canline International Festival. Take a listen. If you see something that's really very targeted to you, and you think it's violated your privacy to get there, it's really creepy and scary, and a lot of people believe that. If you understand the truth, which is that we haven't given any individual information, but we've just taken that ad and shown it, then all of a sudden it's a better experience. And so I think we have a much, much, we have to do a much better job explaining our business model and explaining why targeted advertising is so important to small businesses around the world so that people feel more comfortable because it's a great service. So on a one-on-one -on -one message, you will still perhaps see that ad but it just won't feel creepy even though it is a one-on-one -on -one message? Well, we're working on it, right? Um, but again, it depends. You know, if it's targeted to you and it's a good experience and you believe that no one's reading your messages, and let's be clear, no one's reading your messages, that's a good experience. If it's targeted to you and you're worried about how that happened, mm -hmm. you're less comfortable. And that's why we need to make this case in a much, much clearer way. I like the way that you brought up that this has become a real focus point, privacy. And indeed, we've actually heard sort of the moments from Mark saying, look, I realize I didn't get it quick enough. I made a mistake here. Do you think Facebook, do, have you really come to understand the way in which the consumer is now viewing privacy and how are you building that into your culture, into your business model now? No, I think there has been a growing understanding of how important privacy is and how we have to protect it. I think if you look at some of the early iterations of the Facebook platform, we were allowing people to share too much data early on before 2014. If I used an app, I would share my information and I could share my friend's information. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to remember and this is not an excuse because I think we should have done better. But the real concern then was that we were hoarding data and not sharing it. People were very concerned that we were a walled garden and they couldn't share. And we had this vision that we would enable you to make your apps more social. Mm. So you have a playlist, we're friends, I want to hear your playlist. My friend has a birthday, I want to import that birthday to my calendar. Those are great experiences. But what we've learned over the years is we need to share the minimal amount of data in ways that people really understand it and have full control so we can create those experiences. And I think we're doing that now. Mm. We're also looking for the best models around the world. So we're in Europe. GDPR is the most far-reaching privacy legislation that's been passed. 
Now, it didn't pass anywhere else in the world, but we took those same controls and made them available everywhere. Because we know people care about their privacy and we know we need to give them the tools to understand this. You know, it's your information. You choose to share it with your friends on Facebook. You can choose to share it with businesses or not, and that is up to you. And we need to make it clearer how that works. Do you think the anger that you saw, that you witnessed, was justified? How did you take it, personally? Look, this has been hard. You know, as anyone who kind of wakes up in the morning and is working hard and trying to do the very best I can, being attacked, being attacked personally, not something I'd experienced before and definitely hard, but I think it should be hard. Hmm. Because Mark and I and the other Facebook leaders and even our employees, we have a really big responsibility. I have a really big responsibility. There are things that we missed. We wish we had understood the Russian interference in the US election. We didn't, we missed it. We've worked hard to get ahead of it and I think we've done much better in the recent EU elections, the US midterms. But the fact that this is hard, hard is important because we have a responsibility to people around the world who are using our services and we have a responsibility and I have a responsibility to protect them. It's really nice to hear you say that. Thank you. And I, I think also what I really like you bringing up is GDPR, is the EU elections. We're looking towards, I mean, we're already talking about it until we're blue in the face in the US about the 2020 elections. Are the right safeguards in place, do you think? Well, we're definitely working at building them. So if you think about what happened with election interference on our platform, if you go back to 2016, we were obviously worried about foreign actors interfering, but what that meant at the time was primarily hacking into data, mm. right? That was what foreign actors did. And so we built up defenses there and I think had a very good track record. What we really did not foresee at all, we missed it, everyone missed it. But that's on us, you know, is a new, more insidious threat where people didn't hack in and take stuff, but they wrote, wrote fake stuff. You know, once that happened and we understood it, we knew that we needed to put serious engineering, serious money behind it. We've put billions of dollars into protecting our platform, but we also needed better relationships. So the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has a task force on this now. They didn't have that then. We work with them very closely. Mm. In the EU, we had a very local approach. We took everything we learned in the U.S., but we worked with experts from 28 countries. We had a local operations center here and we were able to systematically find and take things down. We are now taking down a million fake accounts a day. Almost all we take down before anyone's seen them. Now, I am never, ever gonna say to you or anyone else, we know everything that's happening on Facebook, we don't. Mm -hmm. But here's what we know. We know that we can come together with governments around the world and other companies to do better. We know that we are doing better. We've seen it in the EU. We've seen that we can take down these coordinated behavior now and we know that the new threats haven't been invented and we have to be really vigilant to prevent against them and that's what we're doing you saw it in the eu you saw it in the u.s midterms and we're going into elections around the world and the u.s 2020 elections uh, we're going to be as prepared as we possibly can that was facebook coo cheryl sandberg with our own caroline hyde Meantime, lawmakers have been skewering Facebook's plan. Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio responded almost immediately, saying Facebook is already too big to try to dominate another industry without oversight. He joined Bloomberg's David Weston Thursday. Uh, Facebook is, is too, too big and too powerful. Uh, I don't know that people would have said that two or three or five years ago, but the public increasingly believes they're too big and too powerful, uh, to particularly to engage in a risk cyber or a risky cryptocurrency uh, out of working running a cryptocurrency system out of a Swiss bank uh, is a big concern to people so we want to first of all know more second we want some rules around this uh, we know what happened to our banking system 10 years ago and there's this collective amnesia in Washington about what Wall Street did and we also know that the Trump regulators I mean the, the White House looks like a retreat for Wall Street executives we know the Trump regulators um, are, are never as aggressive aimed at, at big companies, whether they're Wall Street banks or whether they're Silicon Valley, as they should be. So we want to shine light on this, first of all, and then figure out what, what uh, Facebook's trying to do and then begin to move with the regulators to, to 
protect the public's, protect the financial system and to protect the, the economy, especially in the, in the, the attacks on privacy that we know Facebook is so well known for. That was Senator Sherrod Brown. Coming up, are you packing your suitcases? It's one of the busiest times of the year for travelers, but is the trade war and market volatility impacting them? Our conversation with Expedia CEO Mark Okerstrom is next. This is Bloomberg. Last week, we learned Airbnb is expanding its experiences business and doubling down on adventure tourism. This as the startup seeks to broaden its business in advance of initial public offering likely next year. It's just one of more travel players trying to be your one-stop shop for all vacation needs. So how are traditional travel sites gearing up to compete? Expedia CEO Mark Okerstrom joined us to weigh in. Well, listen, I think we've always been at the forefront of travel. We've been at this for 20 years, and one thing that has been consistent for 20 years is Hence the use of the word traditional. The, well, no, <laughs> how about experience? Okay. How about that? Okay. Um, the one thing that's been consistent is this is an incredibly competitive industry. And despite all of the competitive forces that have acted on us, Expedia last year did $100 billion of bookings, multiples of the size of Airbnb and many of these players out there. Uh, we've got thousands and thousands of the top engineers and data scientists and product minds in the world focused on travel. And that's how we stay ahead. So let's talk about the short-term rental business, then we'll, we'll go bigger picture. You recently rebranded VRBO to Verbo. Yeah. What right? do you think? I don't know. I don't know. You'll get used to it. <laughs> okay, so why and why not consolidate home away and just yeah. make it one seamless experience? Yeah, you know, Verbo uh, or VRBO has been around for a very long time. And if you go back in time, people used to talk about getting a VRBO for the weekend. It was the noun. And as we went through and did a ton of research here in the U.S. and also internationally about all of the different names we could call the new Verbo, Verbo was the one that actually resonated the most. And so we decided to put all of our effort uh, behind that brand. Uh, we're pretty excited about rolling it out globally in the coming years. Will we be seeing you make acquisitions in this space, make investments in this space? Yeah. You know, listen, I think DN, uh, m and is always part of our playbook, so I would never say never, uh, but we're pretty happy with what we've got in alternative accommodations, and we're pretty excited about putting all of our efforts behind Verbo. Okay, so let's talk about macroeconomic issues. Obviously, yeah. it's June, this is peak travel season, yeah. and yet we've got a U.S.-China trade war, yes. we've got market volatility, mm. we've got an incredible amount of political uncertainty around yeah. the world. How is that impacting yeah. traffic? Well, so far, so good. Um, it looks like a healthy travel environment to us. Recent research done by Expedia here in the U.S. is 85% of people are planning on taking a trip this summer. 15% uh, was for budget constraints, and this is broadly consistent with what we've seen. So Americans are, are traveling. Global travel uh, industry generally looks pretty healthy, so so far, so good. But are you thinking about it? Are you, do you have a plan B yeah. if things go south, which, you know, who knows in this administration? Yeah. Well, listen, we're, we're fortunate that we are a global business. So in good times and bad times, we definitely see shifts in travel patterns. Uh, but people often uh, just take their trips as like the last thing they cut. And maybe they'll take a trip a little bit closer to home. They won't take that trip, you know, overseas, but they travel. And if you look at our results over the 2008, 2009 period, for example, those were some of our strongest years. Mark Okerstrom there, CEO of Expedia. Coming up, on top of Facebook's digital currency news, MoneyGram and Ripple have cut a deal. Will it bring crypto one step closer to the mainstream? And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology. And be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. In other digital currency news, Ripple, the crypto exchange, announced a partnership with global payments provider MoneyGram. The deal will let Ripple serve as a cross-border payment and foreign exchange settlement option for MoneyGram users. Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse joined us Monday. The deal is a big step, I think, for Ripple, but it's even a bigger step for the overall industry. 
as you know well, there's been a lot of excitement around what blockchain and what digital assets and crypto can mean for the industry. And I think it's the reason why players like Facebook are diving in also. But we haven't yet seen much beyond experimentation. And it really at Ripple, I think we are the market leader because we have matured aggressively and we're really solving real problems for real customers. MoneyGram is just the manifestation of that. And as the second largest global remittance company, we're able to have a big impact with one customer and one partner in this. Now, as I understand it, Western Union tested Ripple to use for its network, but it ended up being more ex expensive than its current network. Uh, is MoneyGrab actually saving money by using Ripple? You know, actually what Western Union said was that, you know, they've been around for decades, and what they said is that in our beta time, the time the product hadn't yet launched, they said that we matched the efficiency of what they were already optimized. So my view on that was they had spent decades getting to an efficiency that we matched with a beta product. So I, I was actually really pleased that Western Union could come out and say, we're already as good as their, their you know, the decades they had invested in building out that, that capability. With MoneyGram, we know out of the gates we can actually make their system much more efficient. And the key reason is, today, both Western Union and MoneyGram, they pre-fund accounts around the world so they can make payments. So MoneyGram and Western Union have negative working capital. What our products allow those companies to do is to not pre-fund and to shoot payments in real time. And that's a massive savings in terms of the efficiency, not just in terms of what is the cost in FX, but the capital cost, the outlays, that it's really a dormant asset when you pre-fund those is sitting there waiting for people to make payments. And that's really the transformational thing that XRP as an extremely efficient digital asset allows for the industry. How much equity did Ripple get in this deal? Well, what we committed to do is to invest up to $50 million. We'll end up owning somewhere between about 6 or 7% and 10% of the company. They're going to call, they decide over the course of the next year how much of that $50 million they want to call down. At close, they've called down $30 million at a price of $4.10 per share. So we're excited to be shareholders because we think that actually it's been an undervalued asset. As you may know, uh, Ant Financial tried to buy MoneyGram over a year ago. That was ultimately blocked by CFIUS, but we think it's a, a really undervalued and strategic asset in the overall payments landscape, we couldn't be more excited to have a shared vision of how digital assets can change the nature of how liquidity is managed for payment providers globally. Right, a potential $1.2 billion deal that was blocked by the U.S. government. So what's next? Do you have plans to try to gain share in other existing money transfer services? Well, what's next for us is to continue to build out and expand the number of corridors where we're live today. We work with over 200 banks and financial institutions around the world today. And with this new product around liquidity, we're now uh, enabling liquidity into the Mexican peso and the Philippine peso. We certainly ex expect to be much broader than that, but we've only been live with this product for about six or seven months. So I feel like we made a tremendous progress in a short amount of time. We're going to continue to invest with the customers we have today, as well as expand the number of corridors we support globally. Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse. Quibi, meantime, the new streaming service from the minds of Jeffrey Katzenberg and Meg Whitman isn't launching until 2020, but it is already raking in those ad dollars. The short form streaming service has already hit $100 million in ad revenue. CEO Meg Whitman sat down with Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde, also in Cannes, to talk about what is reeling in these new sponsors. It is a mobile-only platform with Hollywood-quality content in Quick Bytes, married with a fantastic tech platform that allows video to be viewed on mobile in a whole new way. And so what they're excited about is the fact that it is targeted to a millennial audience in a completely brand-safe environment, because nothing gets on Quibi that we don't say gets on Quibi, targeted towards, as I said, this millennial audience on the go during these lean-in moments. And so they think it's a unique opportunity, and that's how we were able to um, you know, announced today that we've got six of the most iconic, innovative brands um, as our launch partners. And giving you plenty of money, 100 yeah. million already signed up yes. of the 150 million you want from advertisers. But this is also a subscription model. Yes, so it is. How will the business model be divided between the two? Yeah, so we have two um, offers for customers. One is $4.99 a month plus advertising, you know, ad supported, and $7.99 a month without ads. And our estimation is that about 75% of our customers will pick the ad 
supported version because it's a little bit cheaper and we think the advertising is going to be of incredibly high quality that will match the content on the app. And, and it's, it's similar in some ways to the Hulu pricing model and about 70% or so of their users have chosen the ad supported version, the ad supported subscription plan. It's interesting that some of the supporters are the Hollywood makers of content. Yes. And how therefore when you've got Disney for example mm -hmm. supporting you but Disney also launching Disney yeah. Plus. Yeah. I mean will you be frenemies? Could they ever be getting into short form? How do you see the competition? Yeah. Well you're right. The first thing is the top eight Hollywood students uh, studios now seven with the Fox Disney merger are all investors in Quibi and they have also made available some of their best showrunners and IP and they want us to be successful and I think the reason is they view this as a growth opportunity for the students. Studios. They are absolutely launching their own OTT subscription service, but it's high quality, long form, living room, television oriented. We are short form, on the mobile, on the go uh, viewing. So it's, we don't actually, neither party thinks that this is competitive. It's an additive thing for their studios to make money on. Maybe perhaps where the competition lies is the likes of who's owning the beaches behind me right now, the likes of YouTube, the likes of Facebook. Now, I thought it was interesting that you've already brought up that your distinctive factor is that there's brand safety. Yes. Everything is chosen by Quibi that yes. will be advertised next to. How are you seeing the reaction at the moment from Capitol Hill, from consumers against some of the, the power that social media has yeah. and, and how that fits with the advertising realm and with your realm? Yeah. Well, listen, you know, advertising has undergone a major disruption in the last decade. I mean, think about how different it was. And whenever there's a big change, often regulators want to look in and see what's happening. And so what we did is we said, listen, you know, we have a very clear view of what we want to offer consumers, and we thought something that hasn't been offered is a mobile-only, brand-safe environment targeted towards millennials, where we're being quite conservative on how we use data and how we share data with advertisers. We won't share personally identified information. We won't share device ID. And we want to be quite conservative. And actually, the advertisers, while some of them wanted access to some of that, they also understood that this is a different time and place where a brand new platform platform and we have a chance to build from the ground up. Apple is urging the Trump administration not to move forward with new tariffs of as much as 25 percent on a new slate of products imported from China. The tech giant says the move would reduce the company's contribution to the U.S. economy and hurt its global competitiveness. The proposed tariffs would affect nearly all major Apple products, including the iPhone. Joining us to discuss, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman and out in Washington, Bloomberg Sarah McGregor, who covers trade for us. So, Mark, I'll start with you. This is the first time Apple specifically mentioned the iPhone phone in a plea to the U.S. government, but are they asking for special treatment here? Yeah, you're right. This is the first time they're mentioning the iPhone. And why that is so critical is because the phone represents two thirds of Apple sales on the baseline, plus pretty much the rest of their sales because people buy the other products because they buy the iPhone. Are they asking for special treatment? Sort of. Basically, Apple is the most significant phone maker coming out of the US. It is pretty much the only company in this unique position of being such a global conglomerate that has such a stronghold on this market while also being an American company that produces pretty much everything in China. So in a way, they're asking for special treatment. But I think if this pass was granted to other phone makers, there's much smaller ones, you know, they wouldn't be too upset about it. Uh, we know, Sarah, that Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, has been to Washington a number of times. He's met with President Trump several times, certainly made an effort to keep the conversation going. But if the administration does slap these new tariffs on this new slate of products, would Apple be an exception? So exactly, Tim Cook was in Washington as uh, early as last week meeting with Trump, talking about trade, among other issues like immigration. So we do know that he does have the ear of Trump. He is able to get an audience with Trump. We also know that in previous round of tariffs, the, you know, the draft list that was put together, Apple was able to get a couple of its products off it. So, you know, there, there is sway, obviously, that comes. Other companies have gotten other items taken off draft, draft lists. Companies can apply, can apply for exemptions. So there are, uh, you know, a whole suite of options at Apple's sort of behest or, or any other company to, to try and avoid these tariffs. That being said, I think, you know, the Trump administration really wants to hit hard, wants to make an impact with the $300 billion if it did move forward with them. So it's really hard to tell how much flexibility they're going to have. 
Now, Mark, Apple comes up in almost every conversation we have about tariffs, but cor correct me if I'm wrong, they really haven't been impacted by tariffs on any products yet at all, right? First of all, I wouldn't correct you if you're wrong, but you are not wrong. <laughs> uh, they, they have not really been uh, impacted by tariffs at, at a significant level. There have been some accessories, some wireless routers that they don't even sell anymore, some old versions of Mac computers that they don't sell anymore. But the iPhone is really Apple's bread and butter, and it's really the core of this debate. We've been talking about, is the iPhone going to be impacted for a year? And this letter is so significant, because this is the first time where Apple's coming out and saying, hey, you know what? please US government, don't do this to us. Right? Basically, they're saying that this is going to hurt you know, their contributions to the U.S. economy, but what it's actually going to hurt, truth be told, are their very high industry-leading margins for these types of products, and they don't want to sacrifice that. Coming up, more companies looking for a backup plan in the escalating trade war. Intel CEO Bob Swan says the chipmaker is now reviewing its global supply chain. Next, this is Bloomberg. Intel is reviewing its supply chain amid growing uncertainty over the U.S.-China trade war. In an exclusive interview with Bloomberg from Tel Aviv, CEO Bob Swan said the company is encouraging both governments to engage in constructive dialogue as it looks to mitigate the impact of tariffs. Take a listen. We have a lot of customers there. We have a uh, factory there. We have assembly and tests, and we have lots of brilliant engineers in China. So it's a big market for us. Our, what we've been focused on is really trying to encourage the governments on both sides to engage in constructive dialogues. And we do not believe that tariffs is an effective way to uh, drive uh, global trade. So that's where, that's where we think we can have some influence. We obviously don't have control. Control. So what we try to do with our customers and our partners is work to mitigate any consequences of tariffs that go into place that could impact the free flow of goods around the world. And we've been focused on that quite a bit because our customers need product and some of our global customers have big assembly operations in China. We need to work constructively, constructively with them to try to mitigate these implications. So I would understand from that that although you, you're um, um, peers like Google, uh, which is starting to shift production out of China, and Apple, uh, that has some kind of plan B in place um, that Intel isn't considering, or at least cr in the back of your mind, you have some uh, kind of backup plan should something happen to shift some of the production out of China? In light of tariffs, we need to think through with our customers and with our own operations, how do we mitigate the flow of goods to reduce any impact that tariffs could have on our respective businesses? Because our belief is higher tariffs ultimately end up in higher prices for consumers around the world, and we do not think that is an effective vehicle. So, you're so we not work there to yet. mitigate those. You're, so you're not there thinking about shifting anything out or you're not even worried about a backup plan, you're really working on mitigating between the governments, mediating? Um, no, um, I think there's multiple things going on. First, we are working with the governments to encourage them to get to a better resolution for the good of global economic trade. That's first. Secondly, we have been working since the tariff started last year, both with what with our manufacturing operations as well as the assembly operations of our customers. We have been working to mitigate the impact of tariffs by looking at more effective ways for the movement of goods around the world so that our products won't be more expensive at point of sale. Do you have anything actionable that you can tell me? What does it mean, mitigate? What do you do? So I think the, um, the, the tariffs, the first three waves of tariffs, have effectively been on product that's assembled in China and shipped to the U.S. So mitigate means how do we move goods? Sometimes our customers will move their operations, and how do we work the global supply chain so less product is coming directly from China 
to the U.S. that will be subject to tariffs. So mitigate means how do we collectively work together as the global supply chain, us, our customers, and our partners, to reduce the impact of higher cost arriving at consumer shelves. Okay, so that does involve perhaps some moving around. Absolutely. So moving on to autonomous cars. Uh, today you took your third ride, I think you told me, in the uh, autonomous car, and I think you tried out a new system, the AV system, that'll be part of a ride hailing service. Um, what's your feeling about it uh, after you come out of this ride? I went on the streets of Jerusalem. So traffic going both ways, on and off ramps, the roundabouts that the cars had to go through with people walking across the street and doors opening and to watch how far mobile eye technology has come to adjust and adapt in a very safe kind of environment. The gentleman behind the wheel that took me on the drive not once that he have to put his hands on the wheel. So it's very incredible. And the most impress impressive thing is to see how far they've come in each one of the successive drives that I've gone on over the last two years. Intel Mobileye announced, I think at the end of last year, um, that they plan to build out a self-driving ride hailing service. Uh, what's going on with that? What can we expect from that? And when can I hail down a RoboCab? Yeah. So the idea um, last year we announced in conjunction with uh, two partners. Volkswagen um, and Champion Motors, um, uh, that Volkswagen would build the car, Mobileye would p build the technology inside the car, and Champion Motors would help assist in the operations of the car to bring mobility as a service here in Israel in the 2021 timeframe. So that's what we've embarked upon, and we're extremely excited about what that means for bringing safe security to address you know, two fundamental problems in the highways in Jerusalem, uh, traffic and safety. And we think with our technologies, we're going to be able to deploy mobility as a service over time here and then expand it across the rest of the world. That was Intel CEO Bob Swan. Coming up, calling out big tech companies, not over privacy, but their carbon footprint. Why investors are saying enough is enough. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Some big tech names like Amazon and Facebook are being called out for how they report or don't report carbon emissions. They're among 700 companies targeted in a campaign backed by a large group of investors like HSBC. The group wants greater transparency when it comes to the environmental impact of these companies. To talk more about this, when it comes to tech's carbon footprint, we spoke with Jesse Michael Keenan of Harvard's Graduate School of Design and Abe Yokel of Congruent Ventures, a VC focused on sustainable housing, farming, energy, and waste management. Their footprint is defined by server farms. Um, and increasingly, we have seen sustainability, for instance, sourcing that power from wind uh, in the Midwest, the United States, for instance. Um, uh, and there has been a, a big push uh, to think in terms of sustainability, not just in terms of primary energy generation, but also in terms of carbon offsets. So I think a lot has been done. But I think, as you suggest, uh, the next frontier is really thinking across the organization and enterprise level risk management uh, to think about climate change and climate adaptation from a primarily a risk management point of view in, in, in from many perspectives. Abe, what's your take on some new companies, you know, their feet being held to the fire? It depends on which new companies you're talking about, but in, uh, from the tech cohort in particular, many of them are pretty forward leaning in thinking about their sustainability uh, and their overall impact for their shareholders, stakeholders, customers, and frankly their employees, which is a big motivating force for a lot of these companies. There's a whole host of different methodologies that you can measure by. CDP is one of them. There's over 150 different frameworks that are used. CDP is probably one of the most frequently cited, which is the Carbon Disclosure Project. So, uh, Jesse, then how would you rate how transparent tech companies in particular are at this moment about their carbon footprint. 
Yeah, I really think it varies. Uh, there have been some uh, who are, uh, let's say, you know, let's say pick on Amazon for a second. Uh, Amazon has a arguably uh, unsustainable model when it comes to logistics. Uh, they are largely, uh, if a carbon tax were implemented, uh, our Amazon Prime accounts would uh, not uh, have a great deal of economic parity. It would be too expensive, frankly. Um, but then you have other companies that uh, are really not in uh, oriented towards logistics or manufacturing or primary production retail um, that I think are much better suited to uh, engage energy efficiency and, and, and other energy technologies. So I think it really runs a, a gamut. So Amazon says, you know, in part in response to this, they've set a goal to reach 50% of all Amazon shipments with net zero carbon by 2030. But Abe, can we really rely on the companies themselves to do the right thing? Or do they need outside pressure from investors and activists? I think they certainly need pressure. So I think there's a rising tide and trend of investor and stakeholder support in actually pushing for disclosure, for sustainability efforts, uh, and we could list about 10 different efforts in that area. Um, it's all caused these tech companies in general to do good things. 50% uh, renewables is a great thing for Amazon from their power procurement. They're going to 100%. They claim that they will be uh, disclosing their full carbon footprint, not through CDP, through their own methodology by the end of the year. So that's all net positive. I think Amazon has a unique challenge actually in that it is a tech company, it has server farms, but it also ships a lot of stuff. Most of the other tech companies do not, and that's a huge carbon footprint. Right, and just as a consumer, I mean, I we all get so many Amazon boxes and we don't know what to do with them. I, I mean, isn't that a problem? I would love to find a sustainable packaging solution to displace the cheap boxes. It's an economic problem, but we're filled with them. Now, Jesse, this is all happening at the same time that the Trump administration is rolling back, you know, much of the work that President Obama did on climate change. So in a way, these investors are fighting an uphill battle. Can corporations really lead on sustainability when perhaps uh, the political winds are blowing elsewhere. Yeah, it's not necessarily um, the case that uh, corporations in the private sector um, uh, has to be led uh, by the hand by the federal government um, in terms of regulation and some discipline. Um, uh, the fact of the matter is th uh, this is good for business. Thinking about not only climate change risk but climate change opportunities and you know we talked a little bit or as referenced a minute ago with the climate disclosure uh, pro or carbon disclosure project rather, but you know we ha now have the task force uh, um, for climate financial disclosure, which I think gives companies a robust methodologies by sector um, to really think about a wide range of risk and a wide range of opportunities. So this isn't you know uh, this isn't altruism. This is about making money in the bottom line. And I think that uh, what we're going to see in the future, um, and I think it's it's emerging now, arguably, uh, is a greening and a browning of asset classes. Uh, and I think companies will soon fall into that, uh, that uh, one way or the other in terms of classifications. Speaking of making money, Abe, uh, we've got about 30 seconds left. I assume there's an investment opportunity in the companies that can help these bigger companies actually decrease their carbon footprint. There's always an investment opportunity <laughs> in things like this. So absolutely, and frankly, our investors uh, are, are pushing for these kinds of changes through our investments. So the University of California is our single biggest stakeholder. Uh, and they're pushing uh, this through us and through their own efforts. So there's a lot going on that's positive. A. Biokol of Congruent Partners and Jesse Michael Keenan of Harvard. And that does it for this edition of the best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. You can tune in every day, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And we're live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology. Be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.